Hi everyone. Tom and I'd like to apologise for the echo in this month's podcast, which we weren't able to remove in post-processing, but if you listen to it in the bath, it should sound just about right. You're listening to Awesome Astronomy. Hello, and welcome to Awesome Astronomy, episode 10 for February 2013, in a month where the solar system grabbed us by the throat to remind us that we really do live in a rather hostile environment. Here to demystify all those cosmic visitors, as always, is Tom. Hello! Well, Tom, you've been in the land of perpetual twilight and walking amongst the souls of Vikings, teaching people about aurora and solar weather mm. over the past week. Mm. Uh, we're going to hear something about that later on. I-, I could speak for a very long time about that, Ralph. Right. A well, very long time. I'm looking forward to that, but I think we're going to have to talk about meteorites, meteors, and asteroids, aren't we? I heard there was some kind of news about meteorites. Yeah. Recently. A lot of people got rather hot under the collar about some events happening on 15th of February. Unrelated we... events, by the way. Entirely unrelated Two events. Two completely unrelated events, but remarkable timing, really. So I suppose mm. we need a bit of backstory here, don't we? So, um, at about half past nine local time, in a place called Chelyabinsk in Russia, which is about a thousand miles east of Moscow, hmm. there was a meteor that NASA have now confirmed was 17 metres wide, and bear in mind that this is still an estimate, but with the with the best scientists involved in this, they're, they're saying it was around 17 metres wide, and about 10,000 tonnes as it entered the atmosphere, we right. had this meteor come searing in, and just some sensational footage from the Russian cameras that recorded this, and almost immediately went out on YouTube, went out on uh, throughout the internet and on the, on the news stations, and the really surprising thing about this was that we had this meteor coming through the atmosphere on exactly the same day that we were all waiting for this quite historic asteroid passing by Earth. Yeah, so that was Friday the 15th of February, and I woke up to this news that a meteor had struck in Russia, and I honestly thought it was some kind of a joke. Yeah. I honestly thought it was a joke. I thought this is some sort of perpetuated story that's been thought up by the world's media or by someone in the world's media to try and scare everyone about the incoming asteroid pass and then as i learned that it wasn't i was quite surprised just as and i saw that footage as well and i was just amazed i don't think i think this must be the first time that any event like this has been recorded on that scale so it really is the most probably the most spectacular event in in living memory to have actually been recorded with so much footage and it just shows you just the value of having Everybody having a camera in their pocket and, 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 and having these, these media available to record these events that it just means you're getting it from every angle from, you can, well, when it was so high up in the sky, you could see it from about six different towns around mm-hmm. the area. Mm-hmm. And, um, the first I heard about it was a text from a, a very credible source, a fellow amateur astronomer in London, Paul Hill. Mm-hmm. So I knew that it was genuine, but my first thought, I think, al- along with a lot of people was, is this something that's part of the asteroid? Mm-hmm. And very quickly we got the news that it wasn't and quite clear that the trajectories would have been wrong because this meteor was coming from east to west, whereas if it was part of uh, 2012 DA14, the asteroid we're expecting later on in the day, that would have come from the south. Yeah. So they were completely unrelated, and I think the odds of that have now been put in at 100 million to one. And quite how they come up with that figure, I don't know. But, um, I've got no idea. I don't even know how they estimate the size of the asteroid. No, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, because we the, the actual fragment, or the largest fragment that, that actually struck the Earth, the largest of meteorite, as it were, hasn't been found yet at the time of us recording this. So maybe they're using the brightness, uh, maybe they're using the speed. Luckily, the, the actual sheer amount of recordings has enabled them to triangulate the position yeah. and direction and the whole trajectory of that strike very accurately. Uh, but as I understand, even though there are thousands of people in a clean-up operation, of which many are still also involved in a quite an extensive search operation, mm-hmm. 
very few fragments have actually been recovered, if any at all. At yeah, time. well, I think um, the majority of the pieces are just very small fragments, about a centimetre in diameter around this giant hole that's been found in a frozen lake, mm. um, where it looks, because of this six metre wide hole in this lake, like that was where the, the main fragment, what will turn out to be the main meteorite, has probably hit it's the earth hit the and earth, yeah. lucky that it was in a, 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 a not populated area and that, that it actually left a mark like that so that people could go and find it and now I, I believe there's scuba divers all over the place looking for this fragment yeah so as uh, as you said it was a six meter wide hole that was left in the ice on the surface of the lake so it's still a bit difficult to tell whether that was a six meter wide object making a perfectly clean cut at the speed it was traveling or i think much more likely a somewhat smaller object that actually made it to the ground mm-hmm. um you know creating a smaller hole but collapsing some of the ice around it yeah. perhaps heating it or otherwise shattering it to fall in uh but uh, it was certainly no larger than six meters this largest fragment and that makes sense if nasa's estimates of a 17 meter body hitting the atmosphere are true then that makes sense i've seen a lot of false reporting on this meteor not uh, i know we're going to get into some of that mm-hmm. a bit later but one of the false reports that I, I read suggested that friction had caused the meteor to burn up, you know, losing much of its outer layers and becoming a much smaller body. And while it is true that the meteor does burn up and all, you know, inbound meteoroids do burn up when they hit the atmosphere. In fact, it's not friction that causes it to burn, but ram pressure. So as the meteor strikes the upper atmosphere, it compresses the air ahead of it quicker than it can get out of the way just at the sheer speed it's traveling. which and this is, is exactly the same as the space shuttle and, and incoming capsules, isn't it? Everything, yeah, everything that, that, that has heat on re-entry, it works in the same principle. It's entering the, or it's, it's colliding with the atmosphere so quickly that the air molecules cannot get out of the way fast enough. So they're just delivered an enormous amount of pressure and that heats them up. And uh, as it does so, that heat is then uh, translated onto the front side, onto the forward or leading edge of the body. Uh, in this case, you know, a large stony meteorite, mm-hmm. basically a chondrite meteorite, about 10% iron, but mostly made of stone. Mm-hmm. And that heat then permeates through the body. And as it gets very close to the ground or close enough, it air bursts. It actually has enough heat to shatter itself into many fragments, which is what we think has happened here. Yeah. And um, and of course, this air burst, it sounds like something that, that happens a long way away. And of course, it does. It is many miles up in the atmosphere, mm. even though when you look at the pictures of it, it looks like it's right overhead. But it was just so big and vaporizing and, and splintering at such speeds that what's really happening is you've got this kinetic energy of this really fast object that's coming in the atmosphere at, well, tens of kilometers a second, slowing down incredibly quickly. And this kinetic energy is then turning into light and heat as it comes over, and you get this huge air burst as the the air that's uh, that's in its wake, kind of like a slipstream, a giant slipstream, that then starts permeating out from this object coming through the atmosphere and just carries the air with it. And that's how we started getting buildings even that were starting to crumble and and windows going in on the buildings that you could see on the images, and also the sonic booms that were setting off car alarms as well. Mm. Now, luckily. I don't think there were any uh, fatalities, but there were well over a thousand people that were taken to hospital. There were yeah. plenty of injuries with people, mostly from from glass damage from, glass. from standing. So they were uh, they were windows. close to windows, and the glass yeah. was blown in. Actually, the sonic booms are interesting on the footage because they it's a very good way to convince yourself of just how far away the meteor actually was when it was seen overhead. So even though it's in dazzlingly bright in all of these images, far outshining the sun uh, on the camera, if if it's a sun facing shot. By the time uh, it's actually passed, there's quite a long delay before the sonic booms are heard and indeed felt by the people who are filming this footage um, and before those uh, before those windows are shattered. And that's just the speed of sound, as it, as it were, through the upper atmosphere, then the lower atmosphere to bring those sonic booms to the ground uh, from, from an object that is so far away. Awesome so um, here at the Awesome Astronomy Bunker, our thoughts go out to everyone who was affected, including those thousand people plus that were injured uh, in this meteorite strike. Events like this are exceedingly rare. The Earth is struck by millions of, of objects every single day, which would many of which would create meteors if they were on the night side. Um, they would be bright enough to be seen, but most of them are, are no larger than a grain of rice. Yeah. This was a huge uh, piece of piece of rock by comparison to most of these objects. But it's not the biggest thing to have made a close approach to the Earth, uh, because, of course, that same day was the approach of the asteroid DA-14, which was discovered last year uh, and very quickly resolved to be making a very close approach this year. It made its approach as predicted at a distance of uh, just about 17,150 miles, I believe, was the closest it came on the evening uh, universal time of the 15th of February. 
And we both attempted to observe this object because it was something that was going to be visible from various parts of the Earth's surface. And you were in West London at the time, and I was in uh, Reykjavik in Iceland at the time. But we had varying degrees of non-success on that. Yes. Well, I think we can probably say that you are more likely to have had more success than me because we were going through your images from Iceland, which are absolutely sensational. I'm hoping they're going to be on the internet soon for you all to look at. And some of the videos that you've taken as well are just absolutely stunning of these wonderful tendrils of light. But also there's the possibility, and we're scouring through the uh, through the images at the moment, that you might have actually captured the asteroid on those frames as well. Whereas I know my retinas definitely didn't capture that asteroid because we were very clouded out. A couple of people at the, uh, the event that we threw for the, uh, the asteroid coming past Earth might have seen it through the, a few gaps in the cloud, but I'm pretty certain that I didn't, so I missed out on quite a historic event there, and I'm very, very sad about that. It's a bit of a shame. I mean, the, the asteroid, for those of our listeners in the UK would have effectively risen with the constellation of Leo in the early evening. We had suggested to people that we knew that a very good time to look UK would be around about 9.30 or between 9 and 10 looking towards the plough mm. or the Big Dipper in the constellation of Ursa Major. This is a very broad region of sky which the asteroid was going to uh, pass through and its magnitude or brightness would still have made it comparable to planets like Uranus and Neptune. So it would have been easy to achieve in binoculars or small telescopes. Yeah. Uh, from where I was in Reykjavik, we had a small telescope set up, very small, I must admit, only a 60 millimeter aperture mm-hmm. uh, with a wide field. And we did observe for a few minutes, but we didn't notice anything moving. We had actually very clear skies, although not the best uh, transparency on that given light. But um, I was out there for another reason, which we'll discuss a little bit later in the show. But I, I did take um, a time lapse of the sky there, and we've yet to trawl through the images and really see if there is anything there. But in theory, the the exposure times on the on the chip would have captured the planets Uranus and Neptune, so it's feasible, just feasible that it's on there. So maybe it'll be on there, and if we do find it, uh, and there is any images or animations that we can present, they will of course appear in the usual place, the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group, which you can find on Facebook by searching for Awesome Astronomy. And as is usual with events like this, when it's been calculated well in advance by expert astronomers that know exactly how far from Earth it's going to pass and at exactly what time it's going to pass, it still doesn't stop the media storm surrounding it. And I think we're probably going to hear a lot more uh, scare stories as we get comet pan stars coming along and comet eyes and later on in the year. But what I'm going to do now is I just want to name and shame a few of the really scurrilous um, media outlets that were really trying to make uh, sales on the back of whipping up a little bit of hysteria and um, just a quick search of the internet to look for some of the more credible uh, media outlets. Um, The Indian International Business Times was telling people to expect phones to be disrupted and the the Daily Mail uh, in the UK said that it may take out telecommunications satellite. You're laughing at the Daily Mail. Oh, the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail. I'm so glad there's there's nothing like the Daily Mail on Mars. I really am. (laughs) But they weren't the only one. There were were quite a few UK news outlets, reputable in inverted commas. The the Cuba news agency, uh, Prensa Latina, was saying that experts study if asteroid 2012 DA14 will collide with Earth. Um, that was just a few days before the event happened, and we were, well, we, we absolutely knew it wasn't going to collide with yes. Earth. Yes. For the record, I think it was about two or three days following the asteroid's discovery. This is back last year. Yeah, back in March. Back in March of 2012. Uh, shortly after the asteroid's discovery, its trajectory was projected for approximately 50 to 60 years. We now have a pretty good understanding of the next, I believe, 600 years of the mm-hmm. asteroid's motion, and, and there are no strikes. Yeah. You know, it, or rather, we're talking negligible percentages, yeah. probabilities of strikes. Even down to the accuracy of using uh, radar images that show the rotation of the planet, so we can actually see how much there's going to be outgassing as it rotates mm-hmm. that will very, very subtly shift its trajectory in space. So mm-hmm. it is incredibly precise, yeah. the, the way these orbits are worked out. But going on to some of the other ones, moving on to the uh, the web-based um, journalistic efforts, um, Science 2.0 website warned us that doomsday prophets were excited about 2012 DA14, which we have absolutely no doubt was the case. <laughs> CommonSenseConspiracy.com, which sounds like an oxymoron in its own right, <laughs> was saying that NASA's own animations indicate the asteroid will hit Earth. And if you just did a quick search on YouTube, that would just show tons of Bible prophecies of this being the rapture. Oh, Fantastic. So, 
As the expert said, it did pass exactly past Earth at the um, at the time that it was predicted to, at the distance that it was predicted to, beneath the orbit of geostationary satellites, and gave astronomers plenty to see and analyse about the composition of the asteroid, but it didn't cause any damage whatsoever. But to recap, phones weren't disrupted, no satellites were taken out, the asteroid didn't collide with Earth, the asteroid isn't now on a collision course with Earth, NASA didn't say it would hit Earth, and people making biblical prophecy claims on YouTube or anywhere else are morons. Oh yes, I totally agree with that statement. It's absolutely absurd seeing the hysteria that was whipped up around this asteroid. And it wasn't confined just to these media outlets as well, was it? No, it was also a lot in the social media too. There was in the social media. I'm going to touch on that in a mo, but before I get there, I just uh, had this recollection of a story that I had read today in the Mars Observer uh, about a leading Russian politician. A leading might be the wrong word, but one particularly conservative Russian politician has come out and stated that the meteorite, which did actually uh, strike, sadly, last fi- uh, last Friday um, in Russia, was a US missile test. And that's a Russian politician. And that's a Russian politician. So if you can have a Russian politician mm. making claims like that, if you can have supposedly professional media outlets mm. making claims about phone line disruption and so on from a passing asteroid then it doesn't surprise me at all that you can have complete non-professionals posting rather irresponsible information to the net too. Uh, I've noticed, for example, on Twitter, which is something that we're very in touch with, and Mm -hmm. you can follow us at AwesomeAstroPod on Twitter, at least a few Twitter accounts that are associated with astronomy have been posting information that does have a certain sensationalist twist to it, which may be driven by an effort of self-promotion rather than in delivering accurate astronomy Mm -hmm. news to the masses. And whilst it seems like harmless fun, uh, if people can read and write in newspapers that there may be a serious credible threat from this asteroid, which we've known for almost a year was going to be no threat at all, uh, then certainly people logging onto Twitter trying to get mm-hmm. their information from what are ostensibly astronomy gurus but are actual non-professionals reposting other people's information. Well, it's a question of being sensible about it, isn't it? Because if people are going to look up to you for advice and you've got to make sure that you're, the advice you're giving them is not only accurate, you would hope for accuracy as a baseline, mm-hmm. but it's certainly got to be non-sensationalized and nothing that's going to cause any hysteria because if people don't know the mm-hmm. facts about something, They can easily be worried about these things. They can easily be worried, and this is a sensitive topic. And try to look at it from the perspective of someone who really has never approached astronomy before. Much of the information surrounding 2012 DA14 was only publicized within the days or perhaps the week before it actually made Mm -hmm. its closest approach. But the asteroid has been known about among the astronomy community for a very long time. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it before last year, knowing that it was going to make a close approach in February of this year. Mm. Um, So if you're suddenly hearing all this news about it, then Mm. it seems it might seem to someone who really doesn't understand much about astronomy that this is a recent discovery and that they've only got 72 hours to live. Yeah, that's right. Even on the the day that we were waiting for the asteroid, um, I was still answering tweets from people asking me, is it a comet? Is it an asteroid? That were asking me, is this thing going to hit us? Um, Were NASA covering something up? So it just goes to show that you can't assume that everybody is going to think what you're saying is a joke. You have to have some responsibility of things that are as as heavy topics as this. So yes, so so our advice to those of you who want to uh, be a responsible social media astronomy guru is uh, just remember that the people reading your tweets might not be experts on the subject and uh, they may be liable to take things which seem playful quite seriously. Okay, so that's the scolding over. Now we can turn to things more lighthearted, more fun, more enjoyable and more spectacular. Tom, tell us all about Iceland. Iceland is a very young, geologically speaking, country, an entirely volcanic island created by a chain of very large volcanoes, which we know quite a lot about because they frequently erupt and pump ash into the atmosphere and everyone's flights are grounded. Uh, But that's not what you really wanted to hear. You wanted to hear about the recent excursion to Iceland. So I travelled with explorers uh, to lead a northern lights trip to Iceland to see the northern lights, the Aurora Borealis. Uh, We do have a predominantly UK listener base back on Earth, although we recognise that we have a very um, healthy number of Scandinavian and Canadian subscribers as well. So I feel quite at home talking about this topic, actually, because those of you in northern Canada, those of you in the northern UK, and those of you in northern Scandinavia, 
you actually all enjoy a range of latitudes that make the aurora borealis something worthwhile to look at. Now, in the UK, admittedly, uh, that's where the worst circumstances are. Someone uh, who I've uh, spoken to before, a very uh, an excellent photographer, uh, Alan Tuff, based up in Moray in Scotland, frequently publishes beautiful images of the aurora seen over the nor- or just on the northern horizon from the north of Scotland. Of course, in Scandinavia, in northern Norway. The aurora is a frequent beautiful sight in Svalbard, a Norwegian island even further north. The aurora are actually studied because Svalbard happens to lie very close to the Earth's geomagnetic pole, which means that uh, they can actually directly observe aurora during the day and night, which is really fascinating. Uh, and in northern Canada, the aurora is a common sight as well, the aurora borealis. Now, of course, the aurora borealis, that's just the northern lights. There is also the aurora australis. And the correct term for the two combined is the Aurora Polaris, or the polar lights. But the Aurora Borealis is is a more interesting name because it was given to us by Galileo, of all people. He was actually the first to give a Latin name to the phenomenon. And his observations were based on his latitude because he lived quite far south in uh, Tuscany. When he saw the Aurora, he actually saw a more reddish colour. He saw them very low down and he saw a very energetic Aurora, which allowed Mm. him to see more of the... Uh, high altitude oxygen and nitrogen which tends to glow with a more reddish color and as a result he thought that it looked like the dawn light coming in the north so he called them the aurora borealis quite literally the dawn of the north the aurora australis of course uh, an extrapolation meaning the dawn of the south but the aurora have gone by many myths and legends before that they've been associated with some quite benign myths for example in lapland they were known as foxfires they were believed to be the uh, flickery glows from the tail of a magical fox dancing in the north. Quite a nice myth. And um, one of my favourites, the Algonquian Indians, uh, they were the native people of the New World, whom the Englishman Thomas Harriot met when he sailed over there. Thomas Harriot, of course, being the first man to use a telescope to make an astronomical observation, as far as we know. Uh, The Algonquians, they believed that their creator, Nana Boso, had travelled to the north after creating the world, and frequently lit campfires or or burned things just to create lights in the north to remind his creation that he still cared about them. Beautiful myths and legends. Uh, but there are some more violent ones as well. In Greece, which is a country of a fairly uh, a somewhat more southerly latitude, only very strong auroral activity would have been seen. It would have been quite infrequent, maybe once in a few generations. And so it was considered to be of more supernatural significance. It was really considered to be battles of their gods and their demons and their angels in the sky so they associated rather more violent myths with the aurora but of course even though philosophers such as aristotle uh, thousands of years ago had suggested that the aurora were a natural phenomenon occurring due to the sun it wasn't until much later that the aurora were actually connected in some way to the earth's magnetic field an interaction between the earth's magnetic field and the sun the first scientist to make real headway with the aurora was a Norwegian scientist, Christian Birkeland, who recreated aurora polaris in his lab. He basically made a sphere which represented the Earth. He gave it an atmosphere and then he fired electrons at it and it had a magnetic field. He actually recreated the aurora in the lab. So he he demonstrated that the phenomenon uh, was possible. Now, one of the things that he falsely believed about the aurora was that uh, the south and north were a mirror image of each other. Um, Recent studies by the Themis spacecraft, T-H-E-M-I-S, have uh, determined that actually they do exhibit slightly different patterns. So they're not actually direct mirror images of each other. And the Earth's magnetic field is not perfectly homogenous from the north to the south. There are minor perturbances there. But the Earth's magnetic field is not the only thing that's responsible uh, for the aurora that we see. Most of it begins with the sun. So as had been theorized for a long time, great minds such as Anders Celsius had talked many times about how the influence of the sun changed the the light. We of course now know that particles from the sun, protons and electrons flowing out in the solar wind are eventually trapped within the Earth's magnetic field. And one of several things can happen, but often the result is that they come close enough to the Earth's polar cusps, which are basically just above the north and south geomagnetic poles. They're actually caught by high altitude currents and then fired, accelerated with tremendous speed and energy directly down to the atmosphere at or around the polar cusps, producing these two auroral ovals. The amazing thing about the auroral ovals is they're visible all the time. They never go away. They're always there, and they've also been observed on uh, on planets such as Saturn and Jupiter. 
A recent study has found by simulating uh, very low mass stars, uh, so-called class M stars, that actually auroral ovals may be visible on them too. Stars themselves may actually uh, generate auroral ovals. And this is quite fascinating. But these are stars that are so small and so cool that it becomes hard to differentiate between them and very large gas giant planets. They're really on the line there. So now, of course, we know that the aurorae are there are visible all the time. And if you're on the night side of the world, of course, they're easy to see. On the day side of the world, um, they're not very easy to see at all. And you need scientific instruments to detect them. You can't see them with your eye. But most of the night auroras that we see are produced by something called the Earth's magneto tail. And we were going to talk a little bit later about the comet uh, coming up next month, which is the Pan-STARRS comet. And just like a comet grows a tail pointing away from the sun, so too does the Earth do that, but it's with the magnetic field. In fact, all the planets have some sort of magneto tail. And this is because the, the solar wind pushes on the sun-facing side of the Earth's magnetic field and causes it to drag backwards away from the Earth. And it grows a tail, a magnetic tail. And if particles get inside of this magnetic tail, as they often do, they can travel back up the Earth's magnetic field and to the poles, and they get accelerated by these currents. And there are various things that can happen to change the strength and therefore the brightness of the aurora seen on the ground. Now, I've been out in Iceland for about five days and five nights, and uh, one of the nights that I was out there was the night of February the 13th going on 14th. So this, of course, um, goes into the morning of Valentine's Day. And it just so happened that we encountered one of the not all too infrequent events that the Earth does encounter as it travels around the Sun. The Sun's magnetic field is rather complicated. It's not quite as easy to describe as the Earth's magnetic field, whereas the Earth is a bit like a bar magnet with a magnetic field closely attached to it and associated with its core, and it's, uh, well, actually associated with the outer core specifically. The Sun's magnetic field is actually carried away from it by particles. The solar wind actually takes the magnetic field with it, and as a result, local areas of the Sun's magnetic field can be completely reversed in polarity. It's possible for a north-south facing magnetic field from the Sun to meet a similarly north-south facing magnetic field for the Earth. But it's also possible for pockets of completely reversed magnetic field to reach the Earth as well. And when that happens, we can have what's called a magnetic storm uh, and a period of what's called magnetic reconnection in the Earth's magneto tail. And quite often this magnetic reconnection events allow substantially larger numbers of protons and electrons to enter the Earth's magnetic shield. And as a result, when they all collectively come towards the polar cusps and get fired down into the atmosphere, we see much stronger periods of aurorae. And we, we get lots of things to warn us when this is happening. Now, an astronomer in Norway on the uh, evening of the 13th, or what to local was him, was the morning of the 14th, actually did detect such a magnetic substorm. And he detected it as a series of ground currents. These are actually currents induced in the ground uh, because of uh, what was happening with the Earth's magnetic field. And if he was to have held up a standard compass at that time, magnetic north would have deviated quite wildly as a result because his local magnetic field was heavily affected by what was going on. But more interestingly, he sighted very strong aurora seen overhead from his location in northern Norway. And I was in Iceland at the same time. Uh, but we saw very, very strong auroras where I were on the same night. Now, it, to, to us, the local time, because our, Iceland is artificially set to universal time, was between about 11 o'clock and midnight on the 13th of February. But nevertheless, because of the time at which this storm was recorded, and because of the length of the storm going on for maybe six hours or so, uh, it's been dubbed quite fondly the Valentine's Day substorm, which is kind of a nice event to have on Valentine's Day. And the aurorae that I saw on that night were absolutely dazzling. We had curtains of green light going from the north, where we were looking over the Lake Kleifervatn on the Reykjanes Peninsula, going all the way over to the southern horizon, going right through Taurus and Orion, as visible from our location, and just going straight down to the mountains on the southern horizon. And we can only assume further still, because there was no, it wasn't uh, diminishing in brightness by that point. It seemed to be just as strong. And it danced and flickered overhead for a good hour before we had to depart because it was a family trip and there were young children there who didn't want to stay up all night. But it was an absolutely magnificent display. And I'll be posting pictures of that on the Awesome Astronomy Facebook group, which you can find on Facebook by typing in Awesome Astronomy. You can't miss it. But what I would say is that with the sun's activity as it is now, and with the frequency of these magnetic storms, and with the frequency of other events that can cause huge auroral displays, so-called coronal mass ejections that are fired from the sun towards the Earth, now is a very good time mm -hmm. to travel to see the aurora. Yeah. 
Some of the best locations to go are northern Norway to Iceland to Alaska or northern Canada. If you can get out to those sorts of locations, then you're going to have a very good chance of seeing them. Almost every image you see every day has got really active sunspots. And if you look at the um, data that's coming from the Solar Dynamics Observatory from NASA, there's just so much activity coming from the sun. Yeah, that's right, because the sun, of course, now approaching or perhaps at, depending on who you ask, the peak of its current cycle. But um, it looks like uh, now is a very good time to go, or a very opportune time to go. We talked in the past about last year's Venus transit. We've just talked about this unprecedented close flyby from an asteroid. And uh, later in the year, we may have an absolutely spectacular comet, maybe one of the most spectacular events to happen for hundreds of years. It seems like there's a lot of once-in-a-lifetime opportunities right now. I don't want to pile another one on top of all our listeners, but the sun's activity right now is very good. For the next couple of years, the auroral activity probably will be remain very good because it often does a couple of years after the peak of the cycle. But the solar physicists are predicting a very long minimum potentially approaching. So we may be going into a very long period of quiet from the sun. There will still be moments where the aurora are really good, but the frequency of those frequent. moments yeah. will go down. So now is the time. Well, it seems like every month we have something to report about the ever-increasing list of exoplanets, or maybe the details about those exoplanets. Ralph, you've got a story coming in from the Kepler spacecraft. Yeah, well, it's it's actually been a fraught couple of weeks in January when it looked like the, the hugely successful half a billion dollar Kepler space telescope mission might be coming to an end. So I'm going to just mention that first before we go on to the discoveries that it made, because the thing that was responsible for potentially taking the Kepler space telescope out of action was a reaction wheel in the attitude and determination control subsystem. And this is what's responsible for keeping the spacecraft precisely pointed at those 150,000 or so stars between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. And the spacecraft needs three of these reaction wheels to work, so NASA naturally built a fourth into the craft as an added precaution or redundancy, but one of those wheels gave up the ghost completely last summer, and friction has been mounting up on a second one at the beginning of this year. So what they've done is put the spacecraft into a safe mode to kind of rest the reaction wheel for 10 days. And this is a procedure they've done before with other faults that they've suspected from the telemetry, from the, the data that's come from the spacecraft. And in doing this, it was hoped that the internal lubricants would then redistribute themselves and, and solve the problem, because if it didn't, then gradual wear on the wheels would lead to a much reduced mission duration, and Kepler's right on the verge of some really, really exciting finds. Mm -hmm. And when they did return the spacecraft to normal operation on the 28th of January, all seemed well. So whether this is a total fix or going to be a recurring problem, we're just going to have to wait and see. We can only hope for the former. Exactly. But on to those exciting finds now, because uh, just before those 10 days in the safe mode, NASA released more data uh, from the spacecraft that showed another 461 planet candidates. And this takes the total now discovered by Kepler up to 2,740 discovered during its three and a half years in operation. And that three and a half year point is important if you're looking for Earth analogues because it allows you to observe three independent transits of a planet around another star out to the same orbital distance that Earth has. And those three transits increase your confidence that you've captured a planet's correct orbit rather than witnessing two or three different planets transiting at different times. The problem, though, is that the farther out from a star you look for planets, the less likely you are to see them transit that star. Just think about the transits of Venus from Earth. You should see one every year, um, but slight differences in the plane of their orbits, only very slight differences, makes these transits very rare. The same is true with exoplanet hunting using the transit method, so we see far more planets closer into their parent star. Now, we know from observations that there are Earth-sized planets orbiting smaller red dwarf stars that have much closer orbits, but many of these are tidally locked, which is going to lead to wild weather systems and, and heat dynamics that could make them rather inhospitable. And we know that red dwarfs are also more active than stars like our own, so these close-in worlds are being bombarded by solar plasma all the time as well. So what we're ideally looking for is planets far enough from their host star to not be tidally locked, and away from the harmful effects of the solar weather, but still in the habitable zone where liquid water can exist, NASA's maxim being follow the water. 
But the newly emerging picture from all the Kepler data is now casting off that early bias that was suggesting the galaxy is filled with Jupiter-sized planets. And I seem to remember quite a while ago, Tom, that we were discussing the, the Kepler findings and we were suggesting that it might well be um, just biases that we were seeing all these Jupiter-sized planets. Yeah, exactly. We, we're now seeing that that, that is the case, that mm-hmm. there, there's a lot more diversity in the planets out there. And it was just the case that you've got these planets that are close in, that are big, so they're the ones that are being extracted out of the noise there. Of course. But the picture now is is still far from complete. So even though the vast majority of discoveries are planets within the orbital distance of Mercury to our Sun, the picture we currently have shows that there's 81 planets much larger than Jupiter in the Kepler data, 202 Jupiter-sized worlds, 351 Earth-sized worlds, and because that's what we're searching for, people are naturally delighted at the abundances there, and then there's 816 super Earths, and as you mentioned in an earlier podcast, Tom, uh, a, a much higher uh, amount of Neptune-sized planets. There's 1,290 of those. But the latest planets added to the list were really intriguing because rather than finding more of these bigger-sized planets like the Neptune and the uh, Jupiter-sized worlds, we actually started finding more of these rocky worlds. 21% of these were super Earths, and 43% of them were Earth-sized. So we're starting to see a lot more Earth-sized planets emerging from the data, and we can only speculate what's going to come out in the next tranche, the next release from NASA. But extrapolating this data, which, bear in mind, is only going to be a fraction of the actual number of exoplanets out there, NASA are comfortable now stating that every sun-like star has planets, one in six stars have an Earth-sized planet, larger planets are actually uncommon, and that's a total reversal, as we mentioned, from the earlier skewed data, and that almost half of the planets discovered have at least one neighbour in that star system. So we're thinking that it's half and half as to whether there's one planet in a solar system or whether there's going to be numerous. And then out of the 461 new discoveries, the interesting, really interesting thing for the astrobiologists is that four are Earth-sized and in the habitable zone. But it's probably worth pointing out here that we give a lot of <laughs> skewed data, if you like. We give a lot of bias towards the Kepler Space Telescope because of the, the wonderful press releases that they give at NASA and because of the data that that is collecting. But it's not just space-based telescopes that are delivering results, is it? That's right. There, there are other stories coming out all the time. Although, to this day that we're recording, Kepler 22b still remains the strongest candidate mm. for an Earth-like planet out there, only two and a half times, or just under the two and a half times the diameter of the Earth, um, and in its star's habitable zone. But uh, like you say, there are discoveries coming from ground-based observatories too, because the HARPS spectrograph in Chile, which uses a radial velocity method to detect planets around other stars, has recently made the news again. Now, back in uh, 2008, you know, it was published in 2009, a team of astronomers using HARPS actually discovered three super-Earths, which you defined earlier, uh, orbiting a fairly nearby star, just over 40 light-years away in the constellation of Pictor, which we call HD 40307. And this is a testament to the value of going back through data that you've already acquired, because quite recently, another team has gone back through the same data, but they've used an alternative reduction method to discover a further three planets around that star. So the number of planets around that star has doubled as a result of simply going back and using a different method, Mm -hmm. arguably a better method, to find even more planets. And uh, it might sound sketchy, but actually looking at their data in the paper which will be published this year uh, following their sort of discovery or well, their work with HARPS in, uh, or work with HARPS data last year in 2012, they are quite confident about these results, and they have good reason to be. And it's the most, the outermost planet, um, which is dubbed uh, HD 40307G, which is the most interesting of the lot. They've put mass limits on the planet of between four and ten Earths, uh, but its radius hasn't been particularly well defined. And that is a a lower limit, but it's orbiting a star which is essentially an orange dwarf. So it's a little bit between a red dwarf and the sun, which is a yellow dwarf star. Uh, But it's cooler than the sun. It's It's a K2 star, whereas the sun is a G2. But its orbit brings it somewhat closer to the star because a year on uh, HD 40307G only takes 198 days, days as they are experienced on the Earth, uh, which means it receives roughly two-thirds, just under two-thirds of the heat from its parent star that the Earth receives from our star. 
And that means that it is actually just within the habitable zone mm -hmm. of that star. So we can only speculate on what the surface might be like. Now, because of the mass estimates placed on the, on the planet of between 4 to 10 Earth masses, it does bring it rather close to the lower mass limit for a gas giant planet. Mm -hmm. So it may be that it's not actually a rocky planet with covered with water. It may be that it's a gas giant planet, a little bit like Uranus, which is about 14 and a half Earth masses, um, or Neptune, which is quite similar. But at the end of the day, uh, it does represent quite a remarkable discovery because it's three planets that were there all along were imaged by HARPS using its radial velocity method, but just simply were not reduced out of the data until recently. So although Kepler has been stealing the show and it's been a remarkably successful mission, we're still seeing a tremendous number of exoplanet discoveries from observatories all over uh, the Earth's surface as well. Yeah, and with the HARPS telescope finding these three more super-Earths taking their tally up to six, uh, it does show that there's still a lot of this work that can be done from the ground. And it's worth pointing out also that you need these different methods of being able to detect for validation and repeatability of the experiments to actually prove that they are there because even with the Kepler data, they call them planet candidates until it's been confirmed by another method like the radial velocity method. Absolutely. So to quickly finish up on the news, um, going over to other NASA spacecraft, we had the NASA's GRAIL mission to reveal the internal lunar structure which ended in December by crashing into the moon after successfully mapping the moon's gravity now it wasn't crashing into the moon by accident or by fault it was actually intended to do that so littering the rest of the solar system but um do we actually get any uh, seismic activity any se seismic readings from the apollo instruments do you know tom i honestly don't know i don't know whether they're still working i know the uh, the mirrors that are on there are still able to reflect the light the, light, the lasers the that are bounced off it's hence how we know that the moon's receding away from us right. every year but i'm not sure whether there's uh, any seismic data to be gotten from that i'll have to check into that one what would be really interesting is if the crash of the grail spacecraft produced any seismic data on those instruments they are still running that's what i'm talking about all oh, right just cut me just cut me out <laughs> i think i've caught the whole of that out yeah and since in the early days the trend was that we didn't talk about exoplanets, we were going to talk about Mars Curiosity as well. So the latest news from Mars is that the Curiosity rover drilled into a rock that would have been saturated with water at some point in the past. And this actually concludes the testing of all the rover's scientific payload, which is now all fully functioning, thankfully. And we await the results from the drill sample taken from the rock. Now Comet Pan Stars, which is coming around, of course, in early March is shaping up to be a really great observational object for observers uh, all over the Northern Hemisphere. It's currently at the time of us recording this podcast making its way through the Southern Hemisphere and it's been uh, tracked now for some time by a lot of very experienced Southern Hemisphere comet hunters. And they do have a lot. Down in Australia, some really fine comet hunters. And, and if you look back over the past few years, there's quite a lot of comets that are actually named after these people, like Lovejoy and Garrett, mm -hmm. that first discovered these comets. So it's wonderful to see the images and actually see the development day by day of how this comet's changing. Yeah, it's growing day by day. So as it's approaching the sun and it's going to be making a, a swing around the sun, its tail is growing. That's probably the most striking thing. But the comet's nucleus is also brightening in magnitude. But... We do have a, a little bit of uh, disappointing news. Initially, we were projecting, or rather I should say the experts tracking this comet were projecting, that it would probably reach a visual magnitude of zero. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a very famous star in the sky, Vega, which represents our, our zeroth magnitude. And although Comet Pan Stars is an extended object, and therefore it wouldn't be as dazzling as a star or a point source at magnitude zero, it would still have been a clear naked eye object. Yeah. What we're seeing now are estimates from our observers, friends in the Southern Hemisphere, that it probably won't brighten much beyond magnitude three, if any at all. So it's going to be more comparable with objects the likes of the Andromeda Galaxy. That's a mag 3.5 extended object. So again, in very good conditions, no doubt a naked eye uh, object, but it might be more of a binocular object for those in urban areas. Yes, and I think it's worth pointing out that although it's an extended object, there's also the fact to take into account that when we first start seeing it, which is going to be around about the evening of the 12th of March, it's also going to be very low down to the horizon because it will have just passed around the sun and making its exit from perihelion, its closest approach, to the sun on the 10th of March. That's assuming that it survives that perihelion, which we're hoping it will do, but it should be at its most brilliant at that point for people in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but it will be low down, so I would suggest if you're going to take a look at it as early on as that, 
then binoculars are going to be the way to go. A couple of days later, um, if you look at it around about the 15th of March, it'll be somewhere between the actual moon and the horizon, but it might be high up enough then that you'll get that balance, that trade-off between it gradually dimming and it being high up in the sky enough to be able to observe it visually. So you want to wait for the afterglow of the sun, setting sun to fade, um, and around about 45 minutes after sunset, looking towards the west and then later towards the northwest uh, in the later time in the month, sort of around the 20th of March onwards, up to sort of the early days of April. But looking towards the west after sunset, that's going to be the time, and 45 minutes or so after sunset, the twilight should have faded sufficiently that um, the pan stars comet will be visible. Now, there is one caveat that needs to be mentioned with uh, actually all comets, but it's particularly um, salient for comet pan stars because this is based on its very hyperbolic orbit. It's predicted to be quite a fresh new comet that's wandered in from the Oort cloud, not one that's made uh, such close approaches to the sun before. So we know from experience that comets of this nature have a tendency to appear quite bright and then fizzle out. And this would be a real pain because right now the comet is passing through the southern hemisphere where only 15% of the Earth's population actually live. It's going to make a swing by around the sun before it becomes visible in the northern hemisphere. And if it does fizzle out at perihelion, it means northern hemisphere observers, the vast majority of the observers on Earth, aren't going to get the best view of it. And that would be a real shame. So we're hoping that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it's worth bearing that in mind because it's best to be a bit reserved when making estimates about how bright a comet is going to appear. Nevertheless... Uh, this is the first of two major comets for 2013, and it absolutely must be observed. So do get out there from around about March the 12th onwards, looking out to the west after sunset. It's going to be an excellent time to look for it. Yeah, and speaking of somebody who prefers to put a camera on the back of a telescope, it's also going to be a fantastic thing to try and image as well. And I'm certainly going to be looking for dark skies to go and image this comet as it passes into the northern hemisphere skies, assuming, as Tom says, that it does make its way past the sun without breaking up. But as we mentioned earlier, the images that we've already seen from the southern hemisphere look really fantastic, and I really wish that I'd got the opportunity to image them now. But um, if it does make its passage past the sun and come into our skies in the northern hemisphere, it's going to be an opportunity for anybody that's interested in astrophotography to get their own images of this. And we don't exactly know what the shape's going to be once it's swung around the sun. But at the moment, it's got this beautiful tail coming away from the comet, directly away from the sun. And it's now starting to fan out into the shape for, for all the nerds out there that looks like the body of a flying V guitar or the Star Trek badge and if it looks anything like that when it swings its way around into the northern hemisphere skies I can't wait to get an image of that one especially after the damp squibs we've had in the past couple of years with cometary visitors if it looks anything like that when it swings around the sun I can't imagine the promotional campaign that's going to be in place for the new Star Trek film based on photographs of that comet that's all I can say and of course, that's not the only comet this year. We've got eyes on coming in uh, November as well. But this is just the warm-up act, and it's right on our doorstep. And hopefully by the time the next episode comes out, we can have something spectacular to talk about that we'll actually be able to see at the time of recording and at the time that you're listening to this. Well, with the first of this year's great comets just around the corner, Comet Panstars, Ralph has been off to speak to the experts and try to get some insight about exactly what we can expect. This month I'm delighted to be joined by Larry Deneau of the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System, or PANSTARS, in what I think you'll agree is a very timely interview. Hi Larry, and welcome to Awesome Astronomy. Hi Ralph, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Well, I should probably start by saying that despite the great interest in the upcoming comet named after your project, I think many people might still be unaware of your project itself. So could you tell us where you're situated and what instruments are currently in use? Certainly. The PanSTARRS project um, has been around since about 2002 when it got started. And uh, we are a, a single um, survey telescope located on the summit of Haleakala on the island of Maui, Hawaii. And, um, and what, what instruments are you using up there? It's primarily just a, uh, a single optical telescope with a 1.8 meter diameter mirror. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there are no other instruments attached to uh, the telescope itself right now. And I understand that this is going to be a phased approach in four stages in total to get to full capability. Can you tell us about the progress and what each phase adds to the array? Well, the telescope that's currently in operation is called PanSTARRS-1. And uh, the reason it's called PanSTARRS-1 is that the original concept for what we want to build is a four telescope system on a single mount um, that are all operated in tandem and pointing at approximately the same part of the sky. The reason why you'd want to do that is to uh, maximize your sensitivity looking at the sky. So more telescopes looking at the same part of the sky means greater sensitivity. 
and you can uh, correct for some deficiencies in your detector by having four images at approximately the same location, but with enough overlap so that gaps and other uh, defects in your detector can be um, made up for by the other telescopes pointing at the same part of the sky. So that's the PanStars 4 concept. The PanStars 1 uh, telescope that's in existence now is a prototype, single telescope version of that, that we're using to shake out the optics of the telescope, the camera, um, and the software pipelines that uh, process the data downstream. So what time is the next phase going to be coming around? Well, right now, PanStars 2 is under construction. That's basically a twin of PanStars 1 um, on Haleakala as well. And uh, that telescope, um, the actual mount and um, dome of the telescope are nearly finished. Um, we're still waiting for the optics to be installed. Um, the camera is going to be the, uh, the the last thing to be completed, uh, our camera is, um, I don't know if it's true anymore, but for a long time was the uh, largest um, digital camera in existence uh, in operation. So our cameras, uh, each image in our camera is 1.4 billion pixels. Wow, and that means that the sky survey you're gonna do is really quite detailed and really uh, sensitive. And I understand that one of your main objectives is gonna be scanning the skies for asteroids, comets, and trojans, etc. That's right, so one of our uh, original funding drivers was to use the PanStars telescope because it has a camera with a, uh, that can handle a very large field of view, but also be very detailed um, to search the sky for hazardous asteroids. So that's actually the part of the mission that I'm working on. But uh, at the same time, the telescope is very capable and um, can do a lot of other astronomy at the same time. And so we have uh, what's called the PanStars-1 Science Consortium that was formed to operate the telescope to execute uh, about a half dozen different, actually there are 12, I think, distinct key projects as they're called, that cover about a half dozen different areas in astronomy, everything from cosmology to solar system. And I understand that you're also going to be cataloging the position of Northern Hemisphere stars too, is that right? That's right. So there are you know, many billions of stars um, that are visible from Hawaii, um, and we're going to you know, build um, the, the current best census of the uh, locations and uh, distances from our sun where possible of all of those stars. So is it purely going to be to, to create the, the best catalog currently available, or you're also hoping to make some scientific findings from the data in that as well? Oh, absolutely. There are uh, many, many different kinds of scientific opportunities in there from a star catalog like this, just because you have so many different objects to investigate, right? So um, examples of, of the interesting, you know, stellars or galactic things you can do are looking for um, planets that are around very faint brown dwarf stars, which are, are hard to see, um, but our telescope can see them. There's uh, the census of you know, the, the thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of stars in our neighborhood, um, all the way to characterizing the distribution of stars within our galaxy. So the, the census um, by itself is important because it gives us a very accurate reference catalog that will be the basis for future astronomy for a while until the next best one is built. Uh -huh. But uh, within all of that data, there are many, many interesting science opportunities. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned about the exoplanets there, and I, I think the Kepler Space Telescope's only managed to find brown dwarf stars that are transiting larger stars. Uh, but mm -hmm. I understand that pan stars are going to be sensitive enough to actually detect Earth-sized planets around brown dwarfs. Is that right? Well, that's an open question. I think the PanStars-4 telescope, as we've conceived it, would be able to do that. PanStars-1, um, it's unclear whether uh, it, it has the capability to do that right now. It's, it's probably marginal at best, uh -huh. but they're looking. And is, is that using the transit method or the radial velocity method? Uh, I believe there's a uh, microlensing uh, effort that's looking for you know changes in very small changes in brightness of, of stars that would indicate a, uh, a planet you know uh, transiting them. Um, yeah. That that's one me method. I think we, that, that's kind of a marginal method. It's possible, but uh, you know they've been the data quality is uh, always improving um, with our prototype system, and so you know there's plans for what scientists want to do, and then the reality you know requires um, a lot of you know uh, working with the data, improving the data to see if you can get those results out, and that's kind of where some of these projects are right now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an impressive array of uses in itself. But I think PanStars also has science objectives on a more galactic and cosmological scale, too, in, in terms of being able to put some more details in about the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So um, there are uh, projects oriented toward understanding the, the large scale structure of the universe, dark matter, trying to you know make headway into the dark energy problem and because of our data set that covers so much of the sky to unprecedented detail, mm -hmm. uh, 
they can, you know, look at the images and the distribution of stars on the sky to you know, look for weak lensing behavior, to look for uh, evidence of dark matter and whatnot. So there's very, very, let's say, far-reaching uh, efforts uh, in cosmology as well with our data. And how long do you think it's going to be before we start getting some of the results on the cosmological scales? I can't give you an exact answer there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they're always working on stuff. Um, we have a consortium meeting coming up next month where all of the key projects get together and uh, talk about their progress. Unfortunately, the data from PanStars is uh, proprietary for one year past the end of the mission, which will end at the end of this year, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and so the results that will come out, um, you know, will be basically limited to, uh, you know, papers, uh, complete papers that are formed. And then after that, um, we can expect to see even more. So, you know, look for them around the end of this year or shortly after for results, you know, having to do with cosmology. Okay, so so moving um, back from the wider universe back into the solar system again, is this likely to increase the number of close passing objects that are detected and give us plenty of warning for any incoming objects? Well, we hope so. Um, you know, the last week has been really good for us uh, because it's brought a lot of visibility to the um, hazardous asteroid part. Mm -hmm. um, so our project to date, um, we started looking for near-Earth asteroids in earnest in uh, late 2010. And um, as of, I think, this month, we're over 500 discovered near-Earth objects. Um, some of them are on, uh, they're on what's called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory hazard list, meaning that the current orbits that we have for them to the accuracy that we know them um, indicate that they, you know, may be dangerous um, anywhere from, you know, five to 100 years in the future. And so we're always, you know, putting a new object up there. Um, there's, there are other projects similar to ours that contribute as well. But, you know, we know that, uh, you know, we're finding lots of these um, near-Earth asteroids. And I think, we, I'm not sure, I can't remember how many, what are called potentially hazardous asteroids we have. Those are near-Earth near asteroids that are not just near, but will come very near to Earth's orbit in the future and also have a size of, uh, say, 140 meters or so, you know, that's deemed large enough to be very destructive. So Yeah, something that could really pack a punch. That's right, that's right. So those guys are the special ones that, uh, you know, we're really looking for. Uh, and what kind of sizes can you detect these potentially hazardous asteroids or, or even the, the meteors that might cause some damage? Well, the meteors, like the one that went over Russia uh, last week, um, that guy, the estimates on that one, I think, are in the 5 to 8 meter range, maybe. Um, yeah, that's a very small object by asteroid standards. And is that is that the kind of size that you think that pan stars might be able to detect? Generally, no. Um, the way we see them is that the light from the sun has to be reflecting off of them. Yeah. And so an object that size will only present enough light, reflect enough light back to us when it's very close to the Earth. And by then, for an object of that size, it's you know too late really to do anything other than you might get a day warning knowing that it's coming in. And that may be enough for, you know, civil defense purposes if, you know, uh, you know that it's targeted toward a uh, populated area. The kinds of objects that PanStars is best at detecting at are objects that are you know, a kilometer in size um, that may be out past Mars or even um, in, in the middle of the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. uh, when we see them, they're very faint out there, but we do see them and are able to determine their orbits well enough to know that, you know, sometime in the future, their, their paths will cross Earth's path. Or at least compost. Yeah, so, so we know, um, you know, we can tell after, you know, several days of observations what their orbits are. And then from there, you know, determine how hazardous these asteroids are. So we're looking for larger things right now, not the things that are, you know, right on top of us. Our survey pattern doesn't lend itself well to finding those kinds of objects. But there are uh, other efforts underway, um, even here at the Institute for Astronomy in Hawaii, to look for what we call these death plunge objects. So objects that are literally, you know, on there, uh, on an impacting trajectory so that we can have anywhere from a few days to a few weeks of, you know, advance warning. So if we, we hear anywhere that there's an incoming object that's been detected by the PanStars equipment, then we know we've, we've got a headache in order. Uh, yes, yeah. For us to find one that's actually on impact would be very unusual, and yeah, certainly would have an, a, a headache on order. That's right. So, okay, if we move on to the eponymous comet that I believe is now already starting to display a nice fanned-out tail to uh, the observers in the Southern Hemisphere, H how did you find this comet, and um, what characteristics have you been able to provide? Well, the way we find objects moving in the solar system is that our telescope essentially goes to the same part of the sky four times a night and takes a picture there. So imagine uh, four pictures taken 15 to 20 minutes apart. Um, an object that's even as far out as Jupiter or Saturn um, will move a little bit across all of those photos. And so um, by creating catalogs of sources in each of the photos and looking for 
positions of uh, objects in the catalog that kind of have this dot to dot motion in a straight line, within one night we can say, okay, this looks like something that's moving. And we send it to an organization called the Minor Planet Center, which is the clearinghouse for observations for all moving objects in the solar system. And uh, when that happens, then a few nights later, our telescope or another telescope may go try to find what are called follow-up observations. They're mathematically associated to be the same object through uh, an orbit fit. And at that point, we know, you know what kind of object it is, mm -hmm. how far out it is, uh, and so on. So in our normal course of looking for asteroids, we do this routinely night after night. We flag certain kinds of objects that are, let's say, fuzzier than what a star might look like in one of our exposures. So a typical star is what we call a point source, which means that they, you know, they're, they're like a tiny narrow beam of light that comes into the telescope and a star and an asteroid, because they're all so distant, even an asteroid is so distant that it does this, presents itself as a, a star-like feature on our detector. And the only way we can distinguish a star from an asteroid is that an asteroid is moving. But a, uh, an object that might be a comet will be a little bit puffed up because of activity on the comet, even when it's out, you know, as far out as Jupiter. And so we flag these nightly associations of things that are moving. We flag the fuzzy ones because we think, oh, this might be a comet. <laughs> so that's exactly how this object was discovered. It was it looks asteroid-like, but the the shape of the uh, of the image of the of the object on our detector was a little bit puffed up compared to a normal star or a regular asteroid. And so that's, you know, set a flag off in our software that said, okay, keep an eye on this guy. Um, let's get it to orbit. It could be an interesting comet. And then shortly after we followed it up, we discovered that the orbit says, yes, it does have a comet orbit. Not only that, but um, its orbit will bring it very close to the sun. And when you have one of those, then you know that you have a chance to have a, a very unusual, exciting object. Because when it comes close to the sun, that's when these objects outgas lots and lots of you know, water and become spectacularly bright. And when when you're looking between the two images to find out whether an object on those images has moved, I presume that's all automated, is it? Yes, it is. So we have a, a software project called the Moving Object Processing System, and that's primarily the, the project that I've been working on since I've been at PanStars. And uh, that software, we call it MOPS, is an automated system to detect uh, solar system objects in PanStars data. And and what are the latest predictions for um, those in the northern hemisphere for the the comet that's named after you guys? Will they um, will they even see comet pan stars? And if so, how how bright is it likely to be? Well, we uh, we're gearing up for um, some observing of this object, so we expect that basically the month of March um, it will be visible to all of us here in Hawaii, um, just above the horizon, you know, after twilight, and then and then later in the month, um, very early in the morning, should get is, the predictions are you know. We don't know how accurate they're going to be. The early predictions, you know, said it would be, they hoped that it would be, you know, maybe magnitude one. Um, the current estimates look like maybe two or three, which is still mm -hmm. naked eye visible um, yeah. and should be very, you know, brilliant through binoculars. Um, but we'll have it visible here for a few weeks here in Hawaii. Um, and then it's going to continue to move north. And so later in the month, uh, toward the end of Mar uh, March and early April, actually will be visible to um, observers uh, much farther north, even as far north as the UK. And, and do you know if any work's been done on this comet so far to be able to determine whether it's likely to, to stay intact or, or break up as it gets towards perihelion? So the predictions I've seen and uh, just conversations with other comet scientists here indicate that, so it's going to become, the, it's perihelion or closest approach to the sun is about uh, 0.3 astronomical units, mm -hmm. uh, so about 30 million miles or 50 million kilometers. And so that's close enough to generate a lot of activity on the comet, but should not cause it to break up. Oh, that's good news. You, you guys must be really itching to get a good look at it close up now. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it gives us a chance to do some public outreach. So what we're going to do in March is have a special night over at uh, one of the beaches here that has a great view of the uh, Western Horizon, and we'll you know set up a bunch of telescopes and binoculars and have astronomers there, and you know give the general public a chance to you know actually see some stuff that came from very far out in the solar system, and you know just stare at it standing there, and that's that's kind of exciting. You know we'll have kids there, we'll have a whole bunch of uh, you know astronomy enthusiasts there. Uh -huh. So for us, um, you know this the discovery of this comet is you know we're not looking for comets; these are sort of residual discoveries from our survey, but they're um, incredible. Uh, opportunities for uh, outreach and to teach about astronomy and so that part of it is really exciting yeah well we're all looking forward to the findings that you and the panstars team will be making over the coming years and we'll certainly be thinking about you when we're gazing up and looking at comet panstars over the next couple of weeks so uh, larry Deneau, thank you very much for speaking with us on awesome astronomy 
Well, thank you so much. Okay, well now we come on to the Q&A section, which I think is probably the part of the show that we like the most, because it's where we get to interact with people that are listening to the show and answer questions on, on topics that matter to people. And the first question that comes in, I think, is a perfect question for you, Tom, with your your in-depth knowledge of astronomy equipment. And this one comes from the Salford Astronomical Society, who are at Sol Astrosoc on Twitter, so go and follow those. And they ask for advice on doublets and triplet refractors for astro imaging. Over to you, Tom. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, if you wanted to do astroimaging, particularly wide field imaging, and you're, you're operating with a reasonable space budget, then you couldn't do really any better than a refractor. The thing about refractors, and if you were to ask myself or co-presenter Ralph here, we, I think we'd both say we're refractor men, is that they offer by far and away the highest contrast of any telescope system out there. And uh, they also tend to, to go above and beyond their aperture. And that's because a lot of modern refractors fall into the category of what we call ED or sometimes apochromatic refractors. The terminology is a bit vague and confusing, but essentially a refractor which has very well figured lens surfaces can go well beyond the classical idea of what sort of resolution can be achieved from a telescope. And that's just based entirely on how accurately the, the, the lenses are actually made and how accurately they're figured. The design of the refractor is far and away the best design, theoretically speaking, for any telescope. The question is whether or not you can control the aberrations that are introduced by lenses. The principle of these is called first order aberration, or more commonly chromatic aberration. And refracting lenses are known to introduce it because light of different colours refracts essentially at different angles, or rather travels at different speeds through a medium. And that's why we see a prisming effect where white light is casts a rainbow when it travels through some kind of glass-to-air surface. Now, of course, refractors contain multiple surfaces, and as a result, the light is obviously scattered or rather refracted uh, as it leaves and enters these surfaces. And so the challenge to the refractor designer is to use the right glass types and to use the, the right sort of surface profiles, that is the actual shapes of the surfaces, to produce a refractor which focuses different colours of light to as common a point as possible at the focal plane. And the focal plane is where you would put your sensor, your chip on your camera or your CCD for the purpose of focusing and capturing an image. But I noticed that your question highlighted doublets and triplets. And triplets are, are often mistaken to be apochromats, whereas doublets are often mistaken to be achromats. And this strictly just isn't true. According to the definition of apochromatism, or rather the best working definition we have, it is possible, theoretically, for a very, very well-designed doublet to produce apochromatic images, and it's possible for a triplet to produce very poor images as well, or, or typically achromatic images. It really just depends on the design of the lens. So you may not necessarily need a triplet for the purposes of imaging. All you really need is a telescope that gives very good color correction, produces a very flat field over the size of the sensor that you're actually using to capture it, and one which ideally has the best focal ratio, the fastest focal ratio possible to limit the exposure times. So a lot of refractors nowadays can perform at f6 or faster for imaging purposes. And those which are, are slower can often be used in conjunction with a reducer. And a focal reducer will make the refractor perform faster. And often it will have also have the added bonus of flattening the field for a typical DSLR sensor or medium format CCD camera. So the best thing to do would be to set a budget and then look at the various combinations of aperture and focal ratio that you can actually get and uh, determine you know, which is the, the best corrected for the job. Remember that whilst triplets, generally speaking, are, do have better color correction as a rule of thumb, there are some excellent doublets out there as well that can do the trick. Uh, there are very common 120mm f7.5 doublets available which make wonderful imaging systems. And there are also very common uh, 80mm f6.25 doublets available. So for imaging, yes, a triplet is generally considered to be better. But bear in mind that no triplet or doublet will produce a perfectly flat field. There are five element telescopes available which do and four element telescopes available in the refractor market. But generally, if you're buying a triplet or a doublet, you'll be using it with a flattener. Just bear that in mind because that allows you to buy perhaps a longer focus doublet, which is very well corrected, and then use it in combination with a flattener reducer and still get very well corrected field, usually at less of the cost. One additional thing to bear in mind is that a, a doublet will cool down faster than a triplet, and it will usually afford a little bit more contrast as well, depending on who makes it. 
Okay, so I'm going to hold your feet to the fire here then, Tom. If you've got somebody that was entering the market for a refractor for imaging, what would you recommend? Give us a couple of examples at the entry level, at mid level, and then for top end. So at the entry level, if you were looking for a good refractor for imaging, I would look at a range of refractors manufactured by Skywatcher. Skywatcher have uh, an 80 millimeter doublet available, which is a superb instrument. You can use it with really a wide range of flatteners and reducers, and you're only going to pay uh, round about 550 or so for the tube, uh, maybe a couple of hundred for a flattener reducer for it. Generally speaking, for a, an apochromatic or ED doublet, that's a good price to be paying. For the sort of medium end of the market, let's say you're setting your budget up to about £2,000, there are some really good 4-inch refractors available. I would look at particularly the 107mm from APM telescopes, and I would also look at the incredibly popular and successful 98mm triplet from William Optics, which is an outstanding telescope. If you're going to go all the way to the high end and you've really got the cash to splash, then you can probably do no better these days with staying with a relatively small aperture but going for the ultimate flat field experience and, and high contrast experience and looking at one of the Japanese refractors such as the Takashi FSQ, that's flat field super quadruplet. Four element refractor like that needs no corrector. It can be used in conjunction with a reducer that produces perfect images but it's fast out of the box and it produces wonderfully flat images over an 88 millimeter circle so it's future-proof for any camera that you're going to buy probably in the next 10 to 15 years. Well, thanks for that, Tom. I think that covers every base there. So we're going to just go for something completely different here now. And this is a question for you, Ralph. And this has come in uh, from Neil Hawkins, or rather Neil Hawkins' 12-year-old daughter. And uh, she's asked, how does Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, help protect the Earth from meteor strikes? A nice contentious one there. Right, well, first of all, it's basically gravity. We've got the planets that, that evolved very early on, and a lot of the debris that was left over in the solar system was trying to be glommed onto the planets, but also the certain resonances, particularly around Jupiter, between Jupiter and Mars, where you get the asteroid belt, where a lot of the this debris that's left over can actually exist in its own right. But you've also got the comets, and you've got free-floating bits of debris early on, particularly in this early era known as the late heavy bombardment, where all of the planets in the solar system were being absolutely bombarded by all this just so much debris that's floating around. And Jupiter being the heaviest planet, having the most mass, draws most of it in. That's mainly the reason why it became the biggest planet in the solar system. It was the most successful at being able to vacuum up all this debris in the solar system. But there's also research to suggest that quite contrary from actually being of benefit to the other planets in the solar system, like the Earth and Mars, in hoovering up all this debris, that actually attracted bodies from the outer solar system, so from the Oort cloud and from the Kuiper belt, where we've got these other objects of uh, rock and, and mostly ice, at those outer extremes, but actually sucking them into the, the inner solar system. So there's also quite a bit of research that suggests that contrary to helping these other planets like Mars and Earth avoid being hit so often by uh, vacuuming up this debris that's floating around the solar system, that Jupiter actually perturbs the orbits of debris that's lying in the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. Now, it's thought that it could actually drag a lot of this debris into the solar system, adding to the, the bombardment at this early time, and still adding to it now by drawing in the larger objects that are drifting around in safe orbits out there. I've not heard anything to counter that as yet, but both theories are really up for debate. So whether it's actually helping Earth and the other planets from being bombarded, or whether it's adding to the bombardment, we just don't know at this time. We just don't know. But in any case, it's always Jupiter's massive gravity working one way or the other to either hoover things up or fling them in with uh, tremendous velocity to the uh, inner mm. solar system. Right, well, thank you very much for those questions. We always enjoy the questions. No housekeeping this month except to say, uh, if you do like the podcast, please give us a review on iTunes. It really does help get us up the podcast rating so that we can reach wider audiences and bring astronomy to more people. Um, you can find us at Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod and also on Facebook by typing Awesome Astronomy into the search bar there. Um, next month, um, the show will be back in Tom's capable hands and we'll be discussing comet pan stars, I imagine, as we're observing it. And we'll also be looking at what the media and internet are whipping up about pan stars too. And it remains to be seen whether the amazing claims that will come out of the media and Twitter uh, will be more amazing than the comet itself. I doubt it, but you never know. Okay, so thanks for listening again this month, and we'll see you again next month. For now, bye! bye.
Awesome Astronomy is produced by Tom Kerrs and Ralph Wilkins, with music courtesy of Dave Dexter and Star Salzman, and is free to distribute for educational purposes. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on our show. You can send them to us through our website, Facebook or Twitter, or email them to us directly via inbox at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Twenty thirteen it still sounds like the future. Yeah, that's because you say it like an American. Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. It should be two thousand thirteen. Two thousand thirteen version. Yeah. It's not it does sound a bit like the future actually. It is time for another Kubrick film. Hmm. Maybe uh something with JJ Abrams involved. No. Oh, okay. <laughs>